Hello, I'm grateful to the organizers of this symposium for inviting me to talk to you on this very important topic, which is the result of a controversies conference that was organized by the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes or KDGO on the topic of early intervention and detection of chronic kidney disease. This conference discussed the compelling case for early detection and treatment of chronic kidney disease. Now, I'm sure we all know that the global burden of chronic kidney disease is high around the world and it is rising all over. What is important for us to recognize is that low income countries and low middle income countries are particularly vulnerable. This is data from Global Burden of Disease Study, which shows the age standardized rates of disability adjusted life years in different parts of the world. And you can see that countries in Africa, in particular Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of South Asia and Southeast Asia, some parts of Middle East, Latin America and Central America are particularly vulnerable to the rising burden of chronic kidney disease. The Global Burden of Disease Study has also shown that CKD will become the fifth leading cause of years of lives lost by the year 2040. Now, we all are familiar with this conceptual framework of chronic kidney disease in which one can start with a normal state of health and then develop certain risk factors which put the individual at increased risk of developing chronic kidney disease. And then unless detected at these stages, can progress through the stage of kidney damage to reduced glomerular filtration rate and to what we now call kidney failure and eventually ultimately leading on to death. Now, complications can develop at all stages on through the life course of chronic kidney disease. But then there are a number of things that we can do which are shown here in the bottom panel and we will uh, go through some of those, uh, but I'm pretty sure that these are self-evident and most of you know this. Why this is important is that if we don't check the progression of kidney disease through the different stages, eventually the individual is going to end up with kidney failure and will require dialysis or kidney transplantation or comprehensive kidney care. So this is the conceptual framework of integrated kidney care that the ISN published as a, uh, as a part of its uh, ESKD strategy. We also know that chronic kidney disease care is expensive uh, and the uh, dialysis care in particular pushes almost 188 million people uh, into experiencing catastrophic healthcare expenditure in low middle income countries. And this, uh, this number is greatest of any other disease group. So what it means is that we need to do something to bring this down. And the way we can bring this down is by catching the disease early and making sure that we can prevent its progression. And this process is called screening or early detection. WHO has laid down a few principles of screening and they all apply to chronic kidney disease. Chronic kidney disease is an important problem. It has a very long asymptomatic phase, which can be detected by affordable testing we know that there are effective and available treatments for preventing progression of chronic kidney disease. We understand the mechanism of disease progression to a large extent. We also know that the screening and treatment must be ongoing and should not be just one episode. And it should eventually be affordable for the overall healthcare budget. These are the treatment gaps, especially in low middle income countries for treatment of patients with chronic kidney disease. We have, as I said before, a large undiagnosed and untreated population. The workforce that is available to take care of these individuals is really inadequate. And our dependence on physician-centric model makes it even more difficult. Healthcare systems to a large extent have focused disproportionately on providing dialysis, which has been to the detriment of setting up effective and organized community programs for detection and treatment of kidney disease in early stages. And finally, whenever such care is available as well, uh, in large parts of the world, guideline-based care does not exist. So to discuss these issues, KDGO organized in the month of October, 2019, this controversies conference on early detection and intervention of chronic kidney disease in Mexico City. And it was attended by more than 50 participants 
which included primary care physicians, nephrologists, uh, other specialists, and most importantly, patient representatives as well. It discussed four major topics. The topic of selection of candidate populations for early detection of kidney disease, the relative diagnostic and predictive characteristics of the various tests that are available to kidney disease, the evidence base for treatments that could reduce the risk of kidney disease progression and cardiovascular event, and finally, the implementation strategies for detection and treatment programs and the key factors that would determine resource allocation and cost effectiveness of these measures. So let's start with the first topic. So the principles that the group agreed on was that we aim to develop the processes which will allow us to identify all or nearly all persons with chronic kidney disease. And how should we do this? We should do this by targeting high risk population which will maximize testing yield. And once we have identified individuals with chronic kidney disease, we have to further go on to detect those who are most likely to progress kidney disease or experience complications such as cardiovascular complications. The participants also agreed that the decisions regarding the age to initiate testing, the frequency of repeat testing, and time to stop testing should all be individualized and it should be based on risk factors, preferences of individuals, and life expectancy of those individuals. Now, the first conclusion that the group made was that people with hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases should be treated or should be screened, let, uh, pardon me, for chronic kidney disease. The importance of hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease is, as a major kidney disease risk factor is not a secret and is well known to everyone. The group also said that kidney disease screening and treatment programs should be implemented in other high-risk individuals and populations, which depends on comorbidities, environmental exposures, or genetic factors. What it means that this population selection will vary at, from place to place. For example, uh, in, in, in some instances, it might be determined by race or ethnicity uh, for people with some multi-system diseases like systemic lupus erythematosus, a few infectious diseases like HIV, uh, those with family history and genetic risk factors. People we know that who have low socioeconomic status, who might experience environmental exposures, who have prior history of acute kidney injury, uh, women with history of preeclampsia, those who have somehow experienced exposure to nephrotoxins in the past, uh, such as uh, use of Chinese herbal medicines or other type of indigenous medicines, and people with obesity are at increased risk of chronic kidney disease. And it is appropriate that case finding uh, principles should be instituted in these populations. Let's go to the second point about diagnostic tests. KDGO for a long time has laid down two essential diagnostic approaches for people with chronic kidney disease. Estimation of glomerular filtration rate and measurement of proteinuria. So using this principle, the group agreed on a triple marker panel, which is serum creatinine, serum cystatin C, and urine albumin to creatinine ratio as uh, as the tests that are needed to screen and risk stratify people with chronic kidney disease. So a dual assessment of estimated glomerular filtration rate and albuminuria is important for CKD screening and risk stratification. Uh, now, it is important to point out that it sounds very easy and, and simple and it sounds intuitive, but the fact is that quantitation of uh, urinary protein excretion uh, even in uh, developed countries like in United States uh, was actually undertaken in less than half of incident CKD population in 2010 to 2012. This proportion would have improved somewhat, but still we think that there is a fair amount uh, of work to be done to make sure that uh, all patients who are at risk of or have early stage chronic kidney disease undergo proteinuria urine albumin creatinine ratio estimation. Now, serum creatinine is widely available and accepted as a measure of GFR estimation around the world. But we now know uh, through evidence that has accumulated over the last uh, decade or so, 
that Cistadin C can offer GFR estimates that, that are more accurate and most importantly, they do not require the incorporation of any correction factor, uh, which was initially uh, used as a race coefficient for African uh, American population in the United States, but si subsequently similar ethnicity or race correction uh, factors or coefficients were developed by other populations as well, including uh, those in China. But the fact is that they're not required for uh, serum cystatin C anymore. However, uh, we do know that serum cystatin C estimation is expensive and the combination of uh, serum cystatin C, serum creatinine and UACR uh, can right now be recommended only for high income settings uh, because even serum creatinine testing is expensive in multiple parts of the world. And this is one publication which the ISN and KDGO group did together which is currently coming out, which, which spoke about the cost of these different modalities of, uh, uh, of, of testing for CKD early detection. So you can look at the various detection parameters, in particular EAGFR esti estimation in, in the form of a pyramid, that we should use creatinine-based EGFR equations for case finding, estimation of population burden, and for routine clinical practice in almost everyone who needs uh, these tests. Then in some special situations, uh, for example, to solve some referral conundrums for, uh, for more advanced nephrologic care or for kid, uh, listing for kidney transplantation. Uh, use in clinical trials, sometimes uh, making decisions about drug dosing, et cetera, we might need to have somewhat more accurate uh, estimation of GFR, which can be done by uh, creatinine cystatin combination or pure serum cystatin-based EGFR equations. And finally, sometimes uh, we need to actually measure GFR, uh, which might be required for research purposes, for donor evaluation, and in some instances in clinical trials also. So you can see that as we go towards the uh, apex or the top of the pyramid, uh, accuracy improves and practice becomes more precise. Whereas at, towards the base of the pyramid, we are more concerned about increasing access to testing and making sure that we do as much as we can to improve population health. The third point, then we look at uh, the evidence base for various uh, treatment options. And these treatment options uh, across the span of the various stages of uh, chronic kidney disease are of course shown here, lifestyle modification, smoking cessation, use of RAS blockade, at least in the early stages of the disease, optimization of blood pressure control, use of statins, optimization of glycemic control in those with diabetes. Now, SGLT2 inhibitors independent of the presence or absence of diabetes. And finally, GLP-1 receptor and agonists in those with diabetes uh, are uh, tried and tested evidence-based methods to slow down the progression of chronic kidney disease. As kidney disease advances, perhaps we should pick up and treat metabolic acidosis, uh, RAS inhibition, uh, in earlier days was thought to be important only uh, in the early to moderate stage of CKD and thought to be risky in people with more advanced disease. But now with the availability of effective treatment for hyperkalemia, perhaps we can extend the benefits of RAS inhibition to later stages of the disease also. And throughout the course, we need to re remember to treat the underlying cause, avoid use of nephrotoxins and adjust medication doses as required. We also concluded that a key rationale for CKD screening is the availability of effective interventions to de delay CKD progression and reduce cardiovascular risk, which was shown on the previous slide. And these measures also can be summarized, and I'm summarizing on this one slide, uh, work that has been done by thousands of researchers uh, and uh, has, under, has required large number of clinical trials, et cetera, but we now know that lifestyle changes such as weight optimization, physical exercise, smoking cessation, and use of a healthy diet of uh, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, blood pressure control, glycemic control, ACE blockers, angiotensin receptor agonists, uh, you know, and angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, 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 please accept my apologies, use of statins, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP agonists, and uh, perhaps sodium bicarbonate, are uh, helpful in slowing CKD progression. 
For some time, uric acid lowering was also thought to be perhaps important, but two recent trials have shown that uric acid was in, lowering was ineffective in slowing kidney disease progression. Uh, accurate diagnosis and staging of CKD is necessary for effective use of treatment. And this cartoon shows uh, what, what all we can do and can be used as a tool to uh, do uh, population sensitization uh, you know, and, and this cartoon was uh, developed in 2016 by Jorge Muniz, uh, which shows what are the various things that can be done. Uh, in early stage, we treat the underlying conditions and comorbidities. As uh, kidney disease progresses, we estimate the rate of progression, evaluate and treat complication, prepare for kidney replacement therapy, and eventually in those who actually go on to require it, uh, dialysis or kidney transplantation should be offered. Then we, also make the point that patient engagement is an important component of effective uh, strategies to screen and treat chronic kidney disease. Patient and family education and engagement is critical and should continue throughout the course of the disease. And, the, and it is associated with a number of potential benefits. Uh, improved patient activation also improves access to healthcare. And it, when, when the patient is aware of why we are doing what we are advising them to do, uh, the access and adherence to medications increase. When the patient is aware of uh, the, uh, the course of the disease, uh, they are much more likely to uh, receive and go to a nephrologist uh, a referral in a timely manner. Uh, they are more likely to consult diabetes and receive education for treatment of underlying conditions such as diabetes. So this uh, paper really talks about uh, you know, health information technology used to uh, improve the care of patients with chronic kidney disease. We all know that uh, information technology-based care is being increasingly promoted, especially in primary care settings for management of non-communicable diseases. And according to this paper, uh, uh, patients with chronic kidney disease who are empowered with IT tools for monitoring, training, and self-management uh, are likely to experience improved outcomes. Uh, you know, so we, we need to increasingly use these tools in our clinical practice as well. The, going to the fourth on, and last topic, uh, we, we looked at uh, the health systems aspect of kidney disease screening and treatment. And, and we say that CKD screening and treatment efforts require multi-stakeholder implementation strategies to overcome barriers to high quality kidney disease care. So providing kidney disease care should not be a job only of nephrologists, but then it requires a number of stakeholders to come together, which starts from politicians because they are the ones who will make decisions, then policymakers, healthcare administrators, hospital managers, nephrologists, uh, primary care physicians, other specialists like diabetologists, cardiologists, but most importantly, non-physician healthcare workers, such as nurses and other frontline healthcare workers, they all have to come together and work with the patients to deliver appropriate care to patients with chronic kidney disease. There are a number of uh, barriers and uh, facilitators which determine how CKD screening programs can be implemented and whether they will be successful. This slide shows you a few of these barriers. These barriers can be divided into patient-related barriers and health system-related barriers. And in terms of patient-related barriers, they are primarily related to knowledge of kidney disease, its associated risk and social risk factors, such as limited financial resources and low health literacy, uh, which allows them to sometimes engage in risk, risky behaviors, for example, continued smoking or not paying attention to reduction of weight and healthy diet, et cetera. But then the number of uh, barriers which are related to health systems are larger. Uh, and some we, we, we do uh, recognize and see that uh, in the health systems and especially in the minds of policymakers, there's a lack of urgency for uh, implementing such programs. Uh, and even primary care clinicians often omit this part of the care uh, of pay people with other conditions, uh, which, uh, which increase the risk of development of chronic kidney disease. There is often a lack of knowledge of uh, chronic kidney disease treatment guidelines in the minds of primary care physicians. Primary care physicians don't often receive incentives for intervention for chronic kidney disease. 
And there is evidence from around the world that when such incentives are put in place, screening for chronic kidney disease improves and thereby care of patients with kidney disease once they are detected gets better. We uh, unfortunately do not have CKD specific clinically, clinical quality measures. And in the end, what we need to also hap happen more effectively is communication between different specialties. For example, primary care physicians, diabetologists, cardiovascular disease specialists, nephrologists, and other such specialists which have to work together to take care of uh, problems of people with chronic kidney disease. Uh, none of this will happen uh, unless there are appropriate incentives, both financial and non-financial, which are aligned with CKD screening risk stratification and treatment. And there is one example from the United States uh, which, in which uh, the US uh, president uh, actually uh, gave this executive order called Advancing American Kidney Health, uh, you know, which, uh, which makes a number of points uh, which uh, incentivizes uh, a conventional payment model and uh, early payment model to make sure that people receive appropriate care uh, for their uh, end stage kidney disease. We also want to make sure that this point goes across to all stakeholders that CKD screening in high risk groups will be cost effective. This is something which is very important and eventually healthcare policymakers. Uh, will make investment only in those actions uh, which will lead eventually to long-term uh, health gains and cost savings. And CKD screening is definitely more cost-effective compared to providing care to people with advanced kidney disease uh, if we don't screen them and they go on to develop this advanced kidney disease. But then it calls for a number of uh, new questions also which needs to be answered by appropriate research. We need to do appropriate cost-effective analysis to overcome limitations of prior studies. Uh, what needs to happen is a focus on uh, proteinuria. Uh, there has been in the past at least uh, a minimal inclusion of cardiovascular outcomes, which are key complications of chronic kidney disease that drive hospitalizations and mortality. Uh, we of, often make assumptions uh, about annual screening, which might be costly and probably unnecessary and screening could be uh, less frequent than annual screening. Previous models did not incorporate patient per perspectives and patient reported outcomes, uh, which needs to change through new research. And a uh, few cost effectiveness studies in the past have included low middle income countries where the greatest burden of chronic kidney disease uh, already exists and is going to uh, be seen in future. So in conclusion, the chronic kidney disease controversies conference participants uh, were convinced uh, that the bulk of evidence supports systematic approaches to screen for, risk stratify, and treat patients with chronic kidney disease. And because interventions to slow CKD progression and reduce cardiovascular disease risk are evidence-based and have been shown to improve outcomes, the focus should be really on strategies which will maximize the deploy of early detection strategies of chronic kidney disease, risk stratification, and appropriate treatment efforts. We also made some conclusions about future research and said that pragmatic trials should be designed to test CKD early screening and inter intervention programs across various high-risk populations using different combinations of measures. Implementation efforts should engage policymakers, local clinicians, the community at large and broader stakeholder in an iterative process. And ultimately, as a community, we need to do large scale randomized control trials, which will generate evidence about the benefits and risks and costs of CKD screening, risk stratification and treatment programs compared to the usual care on clinical endpoints. This manuscript that came out of the controversies conference has now been published in Kidney International in the month of October. And uh, I encourage all of you to go and have a look at that, which describes some of, uh, or most of these points that I have presented to you in the last 20 to 25 minutes or so in greater detail. Uh, we all do hope as a collective that this uh, report will lead to further action and local implementation of the principles that have been enunciated in this report so that we can all work together 
to improve the care of patients with kidney disease. That is our major goal. Thank you very much for your attention.